Welcome to, to the session today. The session is called Dietary Patterns in Cancer Research. I'm really excited in hosting today's session. Studying dietary patterns, I, I think, is an antidote to the reductionism in nutritional research for chronic disease. The methods of dietary patterns have been especially used for the study of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. More recently, some of the patterns that have been applied to cancer research. Although there is overlap in the etiology of chronic diseases, we are still learning what approaches to study dietary patterns are most applicable to cancer prevention. Fortunately, today we have three outstanding speakers who will help to shed light on this topic, uh, which is really becoming increasingly important for cancer research. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to begin the session. Uh, the first speaker uh, we have will be Dr. Teresa Fon, who's a professor at Simmons University in Boston and adjunct professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, she's been at Simmons since 2000 and teaches both undergrads and graduate courses uh, while maintaining research collaboration at Harvard. I've actually known Teresa for over two decades. In fact, she's been giving the lecture on dietary patterns in my course for the past 10 years. And it's actually one of the more popular lectures uh, in the course, if not the most popular. So I'm delighted today to introduce Teresa. She will speak on the current evidence and impact of dietary patterns on chronic disease risk. Teresa. Thank you, Ed, for the introduction. Uh, so I am Teresa Fong and very happy to be here to talk to you about some um, overview issues on dietary patterns. And I also want to thank the AICR for inviting me over here. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I want to give you an overview of what kind of dietary patterns approach there are in terms of studying the etiology of diet and cancer risk. And there are different approaches and they, each of them has its own pros and cons. Unfortunately, there isn't something that can achieve everything that we want in terms of studying etiology, be it clinical applicable. But anyway, that is an area of research that maybe some of you can take on. So dietary patterns is a big term in and encompasses many different things in a diet. Generally, it is defined as the combination of food and the quantities of those food that somebody consumes. And you are very used to studying or reading about individual foods or individual nutrients and its association and how it influences disease risk. Dietary patterns encompasses all those, and we don't try to work out whether it is an independent association, you know, with fully independent association with nuts. And we want to see if there's any actually synergism among all the foods in combination. So this approach is helpful. I am not saying that the individual nutrient and individual foods approach is not helpful. They're totally very important. And they actually the background work before looking at the entire diet. The overall diet, what we call a whole diet approach is useful because people actually eat this way because we eat foods in combination. And there's a lot of studies that look into the trees in terms of individual foods and nutrients already. So now it's time to look at the forest. And in dietary patterns approach, we do not need to worry about, oh my goodness, fully is going to be correlated with fiber intake and it's going to be correlated with vitamin C. So which one is that? And because we are looking at everything as a whole. And there have been clinical trials that has already been done in looking at how look, changing the entire diet, multiple components, can then influence disease risk. The PREDIMED, first of all, looking into cardiovascular disease and the MIND trial looking into cognitive function. All right, so in terms of methods, there are generally roughly three categories of methods in terms of identifying dietary patterns. One of them is looking at 
what are people already eating? So trying to identify the predominant eating patterns in a population or in a subsegment of the population. And these are the exploratory methods. And there's another method that is looking not at what people are already eating and is trying to see how people are eating. Does it adhere to certain criteria? And those criteria could be just healthy diet recommendations, or they could be whether the diets resemble certain regional diets like the Mediterranean diet. So these are what we call a priori methods. That is because the investigator first defined the dietary characteristics first. Then there's a third category of methods to identify dietary patterns, and they're more targeted. And a lot of times they are mechanism targeted to see, to try to identify a combination of foods and quantities that have influence on certain biological mechanisms. And then therefore you can see whether those combination of foods will actually have some influence on actual disease impacts. So let's take a look at the exploratory patterns methods first. The most common one is the principal component analysis that utilizes correlations between food groups because people tend to eat foods in certain ways and certain foods are tends to eat in, in certain combination. So we can look at the correlations between the food groups and you might find out, oh, certain food groups tend to be eaten together. And the investigator gets to name what that combination is. And you may find that another groups of foods that tend to be eaten together and you get to name it what kind of patterns that you want to be, which does create a little confusion because different people like to name things differently. And I actually have incidences in which other readers has misinterpreted the name that, I, that was given to the patterns that I was using. Anyway, these kind of methods looking at existing diet has been used in cancer epidemiology. I'm going to give you some, a few examples and it's very 35,000 feet of looking at things, no details at all. Each of these individual studies definitely has a lot more, more details because when you look at colorectal cancer, the first thing you might think of is, uh, what about the different sites? And so this is just giving you a flavor of what has been done. And many investigators have identified a healthy type of patterns in their population, in the study population, and at the same time has identified unhealthy patterns in the population. So this meta-analysis has, has laid out all the studies. Um, I know that not all of us think about meta-analysis every day. And so let me just walk you briefly through what how this representation is. So each of these dots is one particular studies and the final dot, the last dot here is the summaries, is as a mathematical summary of what is the, the risk estimate of all the studies together with the two edges as the confidence interval. And so generally we can see that the healthy patterns tends to be associated with a lower risk of colorectal cancer and the unhealthy patterns is uh, associated with high risk. Now, each of these patterns identified in different studies is going to be slightly different. It is not the exact same pattern. So you can imagine that, you know, comparison between different studies are going to be a little tricky on that. Less has been done on prostate cancer and the association tend doesn't seem to be anything significant going on for prostate cancer in these healthy patterns or the unhealthy patterns. And again, you know, these are very overall broad ways of looking at the existing diets. And some of these studies have did indeed go into more details in terms of which stage on advanced prostate cancers versus other types. Breast cancer, again, many different studies has, has tried to look at healthy patterns and unhealthy patterns and generally seen an inverse association with the healthy patterns. So it doesn't seem to be much is going on on unhealthy patterns. Again, I know that you are going to be thinking about what about postmenopausal versus premenopausal cancer and the different hormone subtypes and the other kind of genetic markers as well. And so this, uh, and each of these studies, some of them has a little bit more details that, that um, analysis that went into it. But just give you a rough um, an idea of this has been applied in cancer endpoints and non-cancer endpoints as well. All right, so let's take a look at the other type of um, dietary pattern methods, the a priori. In this case, 
you have some idea in mind, you have a particular kind of dietary pattern in mind, you might want to see whether how well people are adhering to a set of healthy eating guidelines, or you might be look interested in how well people are adhering to a particular diet characteristics. And you will have to, you as an investigator will have to set up some kind of criteria to measure people's intake in terms of uh, on, in adherence. So these kind of dietary indexes, it can be constructed for different purposes. Like I mentioned, it could be trying to measure healthy eating, overall healthy eating. Um, and two very common ones, at least in the US, is the alternate healthy eating index, which is developed at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, or the healthy eating index. And I think the current ones is still the 2015 one, which is developed by USDA. And there are also dietary index in which characterizes how people adhere to particular recommendations that is disease focused. For example, there is a diet score called a DASH score, which originally was um, the DASH diet was in the DASH trial originally was um, designed to see what it, it has can reduce blood pressure. And it was very successful, by the way. And then there are also dietary scores that is involved in trying to find a combination of diet in which the components have been known to associate with lower levels of subclinical inflammation. There are also diets, the scores out there try to measure regional diets, and I'm sure that you've all heard of the Mediterranean diets and might have actually come across different Mediterranean diet scores as well. Now, that is not the end. There's all that popular diets out there. If you have an idea, if you have some kind of dietary concepts out there, you can come up with a way to measure people's adherence to it. And actually the most common these days, I just did a Google search and the highest number of searches that came out with some kind, at least in the American their population these days, the, the most highest searchable diets is some variations of the keto diet. So if you don't know what it is, this is actually a very high fat diet, you know, can be up to 90% calories from fat. So you can imagine, oh my gosh, what else? Are, what can these people eating and what are they not eating? Generally, obviously, it is going to be a diet that is very high in fat, very low in carbohydrate, and this picture shows it. Now, if you want to see whether the ketogenic diet is going to have any influence on cancer, what are you going to do? How are you going to come up with a score, a scale, an index, or some way to measure how well people adhere to that, to the ketogenic diet? Generally, people take it in the, I would say the most straightforward approach is to look at it in two different ways. One is what foods are included and not included. So your diet score criteria could have a list of food groups. Then the next thing is you need to decide how much for each of these food groups people need to eat. Maybe for cheese, it is going to be a lot. And so they will score very high on the cheese component if they eat a lot of cheese. But Bread, they're not supposed to be eating that. And so if they don't eat bread, then they are going to score very high on the bread component. So you set up your score in a way that you think that is most representing to the adherence. Now you can imagine that you're going to have some ideas on the paleo, uh, on the ketogenic diet, and I'm going to have some different ideas on setting up the diet score. So you can already imagine that might be a little bit tricky over here. So I'm going to give you the, the, an examples of the Mediterranean diet score because I have to say out of all the one set of regional diets out there, the probably the most variation is going to be coming from the Mediterranean diet score. The ones I'm showing here on the screen actually is not the most common one, but it is a quite a straightforward and easy to understand. So you can see that there is a bunch of food groups over here. And then there is also the quantity, the consumption quantities, in which if somebody is eating at this level of consumption, they get a certain number of points, and then you add up the number of points that way. So this one, this particular example, actually have predefined, very defined, you know, unambiguous um, cut points. Some other Mediterranean diet scores, and not just Mediterranean diet scores, any kind of scores you can do it that way, is to use population intake level as cutoff. They might say that while men in this particular population tends to eat one and a half servings of fruits a day, and so somebody who eats more than one and a half servings, then they will get to get, get a higher point versus lower point. And again, you can imagine that if the cut points are different for every population, every study is going to have a different cut point, and then comparison is actually going to be a little tricky on that. 
So I want to just give you some results out there that different people have done in terms of the Mediterranean diet, meaning in terms of in a form of a score and in epidemiological studies, looking at how it's association with different cancer sites. And yes, some have quite some quite strong inverse association and some, uh, you know, the association is not that strong. Okay, another example, which is the healthy eating index. Again, there's food groups that is aimed for looking at adequacy in which the points and the standard cutoffs are aimed for or measuring adequacy. And there are several components in which the cutoff is set to in terms to aim for measuring moderation. So in this example, there is the criteria of getting maximum points and the criteria of getting zero points. And then anybody who is eating in between will get some points in the between the maximum and the minimum, in which case for total foods would be between zero and five. And so you can assign the weights and you can Im immediately think about, well, you might want to assign the weights certain way and I might want to assign the weights in different ways. And so standardizing the score could be a little bit tricky. You know, give you some results on how the HEI, the Healthy Eating Index, and this is overall cancer incidence, you know, cancer from all sites. And, you know, if you look at this, you know, overall, you can see that generally this score measures adherence to healthy eating recommendations. And so the highest score, which means high adherence to those recommendations. And therefore, a, um, and we are very happy to see that it is also associated with lower risk of cancer overall. All right. And finally, I want to talk about the methods that is targeted towards mechanism. And in terms of mechanism and biological pathways, it can be any biological pathways that you're interested. Some people might be interested in inflammatory pathways, Google homeostasis, or any other type of mechanism. And the goal is to try to find a combination of foods that actually have influence onto those mechanisms and usually using biological markers as a way to represent the, the mechanism and then see whether it can, um, dietary patterns of the combination will eventually be associated with actual disease endpoints. So I'm going to give you two examples. The one is it's very complicated. Um, but it can be more simple. This is the dietary inflammatory scores. The goal is actually not for you to read every single word over here. I just want to show you. It can be very complex based on existing information. You can extract in existing information, define the food groups, come up with some weights because each food group might have different points and have different weights in the overall scores and eventually standardize it and eventually come to a final score in which then you can use it and then compare it with people's intake and then have a number of points that represent somebody's adherence. Reduced rank regression is a way then in which uses biological markers, which is called response variables, but the biological markers will represent a particular biological pathways that you want to target. And then it uses correlations to see people's food groups intake. How well does it correlate to the biological markers? And the statistical methods will then, the correlations will come up with different food combinations that correlates you know, the most with the set of biological markers that the investigator has chosen. And so the combination of foods and the weights that is derived by the statistical methods, by the correlations, um, basically linear regression, is then this combination, then the investigator can use it to examine it with association with different disease endpoints. So in summary, then I've given you a, some ideas on exploratory methods and in principle component analysis, which we can find out what are the predominance diet the food combinations that are in the population. Principal components analysis will not say that, bang, here we go, the computer is going to spit out, oh, people are eating the paleo diet. Nope, it's going to tell you, whoa, these food groups tends to go together. How would you name it? Maybe it looks like the paleo diet. So it, that is how it, it works. On the other hand, there are also the dietary methods that look use existing information. And I have described a little bit about the index as a score in which you come up with the criteria and you come up with ways to measure it. And so therefore the caveat becomes, how do you construct it? And how do different people construct these scores? 
All right. But in the final few minutes, I want to talk just a little bit about food components because regardless it is a, an existing dietary patterns or an index that an investigator construct, they are still can be constructed by individual food groups. And so would some of the food groups have kind of undue influence on the association of the overall score on a disease endpoint? There are some food and beverages and like coffee and alcohol that some people consume in large amounts or small amounts. They might have a, a big weight on a particular person's diet or they might have a little weight on a person's diet. And how would these individual components actually influence the entire score? It's an area that, that worth further exploration. And to give you a little, little example, we have got this little pesky molecule over here called ethanol. Well, ethanol is exist in different mediums. Well, I'll call mediums because you know it can exist in different beverages that has other components in it too. So we don't consume ethanol in isolation and we don't even consume the alcoholic beverages in isolation because they exist in whatever else in the context of whatever else that we are consuming as well. So how would this ethanol influence in and into disease risk in the context of dietary patterns. It's something that further research can actually explore. The ICR and WCRF has the, the continue updating project has already identified, you know, alcohol association with certain cancer risk. And in terms of other health outcomes, you know, alcohol is actually moderate intake might be beneficial for cognitive performance in the elderly. Moderate intake, you know, is associated with lower risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease risk. But how is it going to influence in terms of entire dietary balance? So that's an example of individual foods in the context of dietary patterns. I know Fred will probably talk a little bit more about this, but this is my kind of what and what should we do in the future? My view of what should we do in the future is when there are so many scores out there already, like there's different versions of Mediterranean diet scores already, maybe it is time to standardize, to try to find a way to harmonize the score or come up with something that is actually can also be used as a clinical tool that clinicians or can actually be used in a public health setting as well in terms of guidance for people's eating. Currently, the definition of dietary patterns, people generally look at it as a combination of foods and in specific quantities. But our eating actually goes beyond that. The timing of, of eating, the spacing of our meals, how many meals do we co do consume a day, and the, the energy content or the size of the meals every time we eat those might also influence disease endpoint as well. And those generally has not been captured so much in the dietary patterns research. So that's an area I can see that investigators can go into. I just want to spend 30 seconds talking about this GDQS business, which is the Global Diet Quality Scores, which is a project that is led at, by the Harvard Chan School, in which a team of us was trying to define a very simple score, food groups only, and therefore does not require a nutrient database and that people can actually take it to the field and be it in public health and in clinical aspects to measure people's diet quality. The score has been developed. It is, tried, we try to validate it in lower and middle income country settings in terms of nutrient adequacy and it performed quite well. And it has been done in using the nurse's health study, nurse's health study too, to look at diabetes risk and it's performed quite well, but it is something that if, you, if people are interested in finding a score, that has widespread potential for practice besides in research, then this is something for you to think about, right? And finally, I believe that we, the people who are watching this, this presentation will actually maybe come from different backgrounds. Some of you are basic scientists and how can you contribute to dietary patterns research? And for you, I would say that, you know, continue to discover mechanism and look at association and, and find our mechanism of food components, nutrients, and how it affects biological mechanisms that will have a disease endpoint. And that is how you can actually contribute. For the clinician scientists or the epidemiologist, then we still need more studies on looking at how diet dietary patterns can influence disease risk in different populations, subpopulations, in different subtypes of disease. We still need that. And if you are a clinician, then 
one thing you can do to contribute to dietary balance is actually advise people in the, in the more whole diet approaches and looking at when you give one recommendations, trying to look at the, the entire diet so that looking at a diet approach in terms of giving advice. And for the clinician scientists, epidemiologists and clinicians, we also need to continue to actually def to develop clinical tools. What we really need, I would say that, the, or I should say more hands should be on deck to develop clinical tools because we do have a lot of research data and it, it, the clinicians are wanting something to help them to apply it to practice. So I hope this gives you some ideas on what dietary patterns is, a little bit about the little nuances, what we know about cancer endpoints and how you can be part of this process as well. So I look forward to the questions that we are going to discuss in later on. But for the next speaker, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Fred Tabong. Fred is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at Ohio State. He's also a member of their Comprehensive Cancer Center. His research focuses on the role of diet and cancer risk and survival, and especially with a focus on gastrointestinal cancers. I know Fred very well. He was uh, actually did his postdoc at uh, Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And during the time, he did outstanding work in developing uh, dietary patterns based on how the uh, diet influences potential mechanisms on cancers, such as inflammation uh, and insulin secretion. So Fred has actually continued his work on at OSU. So he's uh, ideally suited for the next talk. Uh, the title of his talk is Challenges, Opportunities, and Future Strategies in Dietary Pattern Research. So Fred, I look forward to your talk. Thank you, Ed, for that kind introduction. My name is Fred Tabong, and I'm an assistant professor at the Ohio State University College of Medicine and uh, affiliated with the Comprehensive Cancer Center as well. I'm really delighted to speak in this uh, session today, which is my favorite, talking about dietary patterns. My talk is divided into three main sections. I'll provide an overview, but thanks to uh, Dr. Teresa Fong, she's really provided an excellent background that will make me move quickly through the background and then uh, get to the challenges and opportunities in the synthesis of uh, evidence on dietary patterns and end with some conclusions and suggestions for, for future research. So the a posteriori dietary patterns, uh, Dr. Fung has already given a very excellent background here. The question that is addressed by this matter of dietary patterns research is what the elements of the diet that track together in explaining variation in the diet, basically how people combine food uh, to eat. And in 2017, I worked with Teresa and, and Lisa Brown on a review paper that we examined quite, we did a comprehensive review of the literature that identified almost 50 papers that were previously published uh, covering a period of 17 years to look at uh, the evidence on dietary patterns in relation to colorectal cancer risk. And we started by looking at the, doing a synthesis of the, the major food groups that comprise the the data-driven or population-specific dietary patterns. And what came out was of the 50 studies that we included, we picked out two studies representative of each region, like two from North America, two from South America, two from, uh, from Europe, two from Korea and Japan, and two studies from the Middle East. And what we found was similar patterns emerge despite variability that is introduced by the regional differences in types and availability of foods and the arbitrary decisions that are involved in, in the principal components analysis procedure, as uh, Dr. Fung explained in her talk. But there are major food groups that cut across these dietary patterns in different populations. The specific foods that comprise these food groups may not exactly be the same because of natural differences and availability in food by regions, but we did find some consistency uh, across different regions in terms of the food groups that make up the region. Dr. Fung has already provided a 
a great background on the association of the different PCA derived patterns in relation to, um, to, to cancer. And these studies have found very strong association between colon cancer, prudent dietary patterns uh, with decreased risk of colon cancer, lung and, uh, and breast cancer. And the same methods of deriving dietary patterns are also identified that a Western or unhealthy dietary pattern is in, uh, associated with increased risk of, uh, of colon cancer. Data for other cancer sites is much more limited and also limited to case control studies that have, that is always difficult to tease out whether it is the cancer that influence a particular way of eating or whether it's actually the diet that influences the development of the cancer. That's the limitation with, uh, with such study designs. And in 2018, Garcia Larson also conducted a, a synthesis of uh, these studies that uh, found a strong association with risk of developing colorectal cancer. So a brief summary here is that um, the PCA-derived dietary patterns are identified a healthy or prudent dietary pattern that is related with reduced risk of colorectal, lung, and breast cancer, and uh, a Western or unhealthy dietary pattern associated with risk of uh, higher risk of colorectal cancer. Uh, moving into the index-based pattern, I like to think of these uh, methods of deriving dietary patterns as addressing broad questions uh, in dietary patterns research. Uh, and the, the question, as I like to think about it, that the index-based uh, patterns address is the components of the diet that have been found to be associated with the specific health outcomes or the components of the diet that constitute a specific way of, of, of eating. And in that review paper that I mentioned a while ago, we also did a similar synthesis of the food groups that make up these uh, indices, uh, the healthy eating index, alternative healthy eating index, the dietary approaches to stop hypertension, the typical Mediterranean diet, and I mentioned typical because there are several, as Dr. Fong mentioned, and the WCR, uh, AICR diet. And as you can see, these indices do include food groups. The specifics of the foods that make up these food groups may be different. When you get down to the technical details, it may not exactly be the same, but uh, they do have several major food groups that are common between uh, these a priori defined patterns. And the evidence shows that higher adherence to uh, these healthy dietary indices is associated with reduced risk. The evidence is very strong for colorectal cancer and also for, for breast cancer, but limited for other uh, dietary indices and patterns. Now, the third category of dietary patterns is the mechanism-based patterns that Dr. Fong mentioned in her talk. And it is an area that a lot of my research is, uh, is focused on. These empirical hypothesis-oriented dietary patterns combine the advantages of the a priori and the a posteriori data-driven patterns. So like Dr. Fong mentioned, the patterns are data-driven, which means uh, they use uh, population-specific uh, aspects, statistical uh, methods such as reduced from regression and uh, stepwise linear regression. These are easy approaches to apply to the dietary pattern to derive a dietary pattern. Uh, yet they are based on a specific hypothesis linking diet and health outcomes. And so the question that is addressed by this set of methods of deriving dietary patterns is the combination of foods that explain the most variation in the set of intermediate health outcomes. And such intermediates could be inflammation, insulin, uh, glucose response. And so I will focus mainly on these two that we've applied um, the previous uh, uh, few years, the empirical dietary inflammatory pattern score, uh, which assesses the ability or the potential of the diet to contribute to chronic systemic inflammation and the empirical dietary index for hyperinsulinemia that assesses the ability or the potential of the dietary pattern to contribute to chronic sustained insulin hypersecretion. So to develop the EDIP and EDIH scores, we created dietary prediction models using data from the Gnosis Health Study at Harvard. And the hypothesis, the biomarker, the intermediate that we use for the insulinemic dietary pattern was C-peptide as a marker of beta cell secretory activity. And we also use uh, these three inflammatory markers here in reduced rank regression models to develop the EDIP, uh, the inflammatory dietary pattern. 
So the foods enter the immigration models in very unbiased. By unbiased here, I mean unsupervised. We didn't ask the model to retain specific foods or beverages. We just let the combination play out till the end, and we picked out the uh, the final the components the food groups that were retained in the final statistical model that to comprise components of the schools. So the food groups intake values are weighted by uh, the regression coefficients and then summed across all the foods to constitute the scores for each individual. And so these scores are relative, they are not absolute. Higher scores present more pro-inflammatory dietary pattern or more hyperinsulinemic dietary pattern, while lower scores indicate more anti-inflammatory dietary pattern or low insulinemic um, dietary pattern. These are the components of the EDIH and the EDIP. So the positive components means increasing towards more pro-inflammatory or uh, hyperinsulinemic dietary patterns, and the negative ones indicate that it's pulling the score down towards uh, low insulinemic or anti-inflammatory. And you can see full fat here um, uh, pulls the score downwards and uh, green leafy vegetables as well. Pizza for uh, the EDIP, which is a, um, uh, a source of um, a full fat dairy as well as uh, cooked tomato paste. And these two scores also pick up components that are common between both schools, such as red meat, processed meat, starchy vegetables, refined grains. Uh, sugar sweet beverages that pull the scores towards the uh, the positive side, the uh, the more pro-inflammatory or more hyperinsulinemic, and coffee and wine and, and non-starchy vegetables and fruits towards the more anti-inflammatory or low insulinemic patterns. In the past couple of years, we have applied the two scores, and these two uh, dietary patterns have actually showed very strong correlations with BMI and weight gain and type 2 diabetes risk. And we've also looked at uh, the scores in relation to several cancer sites, and the scores have been consistently associated with higher risk of developing certain cancers. So with that background, I will move to look at the, uh, the challenges in synthesizing evidence from a dietary pattern. So some foods and beverages are controversial in dietary patterns, and one of them is alcoholic beverages. Uh, that Dr. Fong really presented a great uh, background on alcohol, um, the types of alcohol that is consumed, the amount that is consumed, is it moderate alcohol versus no alcohol or excessive alcohol? And in what context is it, is it consumed? These are outstanding questions that haven't been answered. The type of alcohol that is consumed, is it red wine, white wine? Is it liquor that is consumed maybe with sugar sweetened beverages? or beer, is the alcohol picked up in the data-driven or in an index space? The Mediterranean dietary pattern as well as the alternative health eating index do include moderate alcohol as part of, as part of the score, but some data-driven dietary patterns also pick up the score. So, and as I mentioned, these patterns uh, basically pick up the combination, how foods are combined and eaten. So, some people might be drinking and, and eating a Western dietary pattern, and these would pick up together. So the, the dietary pattern method is also very important, and the biological mechanisms of alcohol metabolism within a dietary pattern needs also to be, to be explored. The other um, major food type is dairy that is consumed by a lot of people. Dairy is a good source of fat, protein, and calcium. The, the type of dairy matrix is really important, whether it is fermented or unfermented in the dietary pattern. Yogurt and cheese have shown up in recent studies as related to uh, lower risk of disease outcomes compared to unfermented dairy such as butter. And the biological mechanisms of action of dairy within a dietary pattern also needs to be, to be explored. The implications of this would be whether these foods are indispensable in a healthy dietary pattern. Do we need to have these foods in a dietary pattern to be able to uh, consume a healthy dietary pattern? Some people may be intolerant. Does it mean they may not be able to uh, eat a dietary pattern? One advantage of dietary pattern though is that there should be multiple ways of achieving 
a healthy dietary pattern so that one specific food may not be indispensable. Comparability of dietary patterns is also another challenge in synthesizing dietary patterns, evidence from dietary patterns in relation to cancer risk. For the index-based patterns, it is, they are standardized. They start off with a predefined set of components. And that is a huge advantage that we start off with a predefined set of components, but uh, in operationalizing these course, um, we've come to realize that it is difficult to directly compare the same index across different regions of populations. The Mediterranean dietary pattern is operationalized a little differently, and even practically within the different countries, Mediterranean region, uh, the Mediterranean diet is not exactly the same, and it's also difficult to compare uh, between different indices. Looking at the same index. Here, the Mediterranean dietary pattern uh, across different studies. You can see that some of the indices that are designed to measure adherence to the Mediterranean diet don't always include the same foods. Or even when they include the same foods, the cut points may not exactly be the same across the different studies. Same for the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Uh, operationalized across different populations. The, the, the component foods may not always be, be the same. And in terms of comparing across the different dietary indices, um, so here's the healthy eating index, the alternative healthy eating index, the alternative Mediterranean dietary pattern, and the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. I like this because it was operationalized within the same study. And you can see, you can easily compare across the different indices and see that not all components are included in, in these four indices. And even when some of the components cut across the different indices, the cut points are not exactly the same. Looking specifically at the healthy eating index and the alternative healthy eating index, there are differences in terms of food components. And within the alternative healthy eating index, there are slight differences like these other studies that include the ratio of white to red meat. When this study by uh, Stephanie Shiva was the original study that designed the alternative healthy eating in 2010. And so it is pretty much standardized, but across the different study populations, they may operationalize the index a little differently. But does it matter? What are the implications? Does it really matter for disease uh, risk estimation? An attempt to answer that question was taken up by the Dietary Patterns Methods Project led by the NCI, in which they standardize four indices, the Healthy Eating Index 2010, Alternative Healthy Index, the Alternative Mediterranean Dietary Score, and the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension Diet in three cohorts. And they found very consistent association between higher adherence to these four uh, dietary indices and overall mortality, cardiovascular disease mortality and, and cancer mortality. You can see these represent the association and there's a lot of consistency here. So this was for a standardized calculation of the score within uh, by the same group within these three different cohorts. This study here by Chanash and colleagues looked at the different indices in relation to type 2 diabetes risk. And you can see that the Mediterranean dietary score, even though it is operationalized slightly differently across different populations, across different regions, there was a tendency of lower risk to higher adherence, however, the Mediterranean dietary score was defined in relation to risk of type 2 diabetes. Same for the dietary approaches to stop hypertension diet. Operationalized a little differently across the different populations, yet the tendency was higher adherence led to lower risk of type 2 diabetes and the alternative health eating index as well. So there is consistency within the index as well as across the different indices. The other example is the dietary approach to stop hypertension here that was estimated within the same study using different scoring algorithms. This one designed by uh, Dr. Fong, Dr. Millen, and Dr. Dixon here. You can see that the one by Millen 
includes only nutrients, not even foods, includes only nutrients adjusted for total energy intake. And the correlations are pretty moderate to strong, except for, you know, this pair here by Dixon and Mellon had very uh, low correlations. Otherwise, the correlations were pretty moderate to strong. And there's a lot of data on this slide, but the main takeaway here is the consistency in the associations between these different, the dice score uh, calculated using different scoring algorithms in relation to colorectal cancer risk. And, and the evidence is pretty consistent that higher adherence to the, uh, the DASH dietary pattern um, is associated with lower risk of uh, colorectal cancer. The other challenge is about interpretation of dietary patterns. The a posteriori or data-driven patterns, as I mentioned previously, it tracks how foods are combined and consumed in the population. So the same people within populations can score highly on the Western dietary pattern and also highly on the prudent dietary pattern. And this is in contrast to the index-based patterns where your adherence is either high or low, not high and low. And so it makes it easy when people are classified in one direction of the score so that you can easily know what to reduce in the dietary pattern and what to increase in the dietary pattern towards uh, disease prevention. But for the a posteriori or data-driven dietary pattern, that's not exactly the same. And this is nicely illustrated by uh, this graph here from the review paper from Dr. Steck and Murphy. You can see that these two dietary patterns are separated by just a few foods and intake on all the other foods is, is very similar. But what does it mean? What are the implications for translation in cancer prevention and control study or into dietary guidance? I previously showed you these two tables from our review paper in 2017 in two separate slides, but I combined both tables in this one slide just to say that, you know, when we synthesize the food groups, the food group components in both the index base or the a priori dietary patterns, there were a lot of similarities. This is the food groups that comprise the PCA, the principal components and uh, the dietary patterns derived from principal components analysis across five regions of the world. That consistency also, you know, is very similar. The same foods that we are picked up across the five regions of the world were also picked up in the index-based pattern. So to me, it doesn't mean that even though people might be high on both an unhealthy and a healthy dietary pattern doesn't mean that the, the evidence might not be used for translation, but can be combined across different dietary patterns methods in order to make great use of the available evidence. When it comes to plant-based dietary patterns, are all plant-based dietary patterns healthy? That is not the case. Ambika Satija, who worked in Frank Ho's group at Harvard, constructed dietary indices separating out healthy plant foods versus unhealthy plant foods and, and animal foods, and examined the association with uh, type 2 diabetes and weight change. And what she found was adhering to an unhealthy plant based diet, you can see that the the risk of type 2 diabetes quickly separates out from the second day side. Higher adherence to a, an unhealthy plant-based dietary pattern based on, on this classification here, uh, having increasingly higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes compared to those who adhere to a healthier a, a plant-based dietary pattern. And the, the other message from this graph is that you don't actually have to eliminate everything in an unhealthy dietary pattern to be able to uh, begin to see reduction in risk of type 2 diabetes. You don't have to be in the 10th decile, for example, but even making minimal changes can actually translate into, into gains. For weight change, uh, which is 
pretty much related to type 2 diabetes. And these two factors are actually intermediates in, uh, in cancer, changing to higher adherence uh, to a plant-based dietary pattern was related to uh, increasingly less weight gain compared to lower adherence, uh, similarly for the unhealthy plant-based diet. So I will switch gears here and um, try to make some conclusions out of these and uh, suggestions for future research. So I hope that the evidence I presented do show that despite these meteorological challenges, the dietary pattern approach still offers the most realistic way for, uh, for diet research and translation of findings to dietary guidance. As Dr. Fong mentioned, when you are looking at the at a dietary pattern, you are looking at the totality of the diet so that you are not consuming a dietary pattern to prevent one disease while looking over your shoulder whether the other disease is coming at you. The 2018 World Cancer Research Fund, American Institute for Cancer Research third expert report examined the evidence for dietary patterns and cancer risk and concluded that the evidence was uh, too scarce to draw uh, conclusions. And so they put together a panel of experts to advise on how best to capture, assess, and analyze data on dietary patterns and cancer and cancer risk and, and survival. And so in the next couple of years, we may begin to see the results of some of these uh, efforts come nicely together. Interpretation of findings from dietary pattern studies should be done by careful synthesis, both uh, qualitative synthesis and uh, as well as quantitative synthesis. It's always ideal to come up with a single number that defines risk, but conducting a qualitative synthesis is also very meaningful and can help in translation of the evidence to, to dietary guidance. We still need well-designed studies uh, to further elucidate the role of alcohol, dairy, and other foods, including vegetables as components of dietary patterns. And from Dr. Fong's talk, you all know where you can fit to help move this agenda forward. And lastly, although emerging Research is focusing on the association between dietary patterns and patient outcomes after a cancer diagnosis. The current size of the literature is very small and more studies are needed. And these are uh, different than mortality studies that look at uh, the aggressiveness uh, of the cancer. This is looking at a study sample that is comprised mainly of people who may have been diagnosed with, with cancer. And with that, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge that some of the uh, challenges that I presented here, uh, we had discussed in the WCRF COP transition dietary pattern work stream that I was honored to be a part of. And uh, some of the slides that I, I shared with you were actually made by Teresa Norad from uh, Imperial College London. However, I also want to put in that disclaimer here that uh, the presentation is not an official a statement of the work stream or an endorsement from the work stream members. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to introduce the next speaker, Melissa Maiton Shepherd of the American Institute of Cancer Research. Uh, Melissa has extensive experience in public health policy, particularly as a writer, analyst, and strategist. She's a founder and principal of MMS uh, Health Strategies. And she has been a public policy consultant for the AICR. Melissa has 15 years of experience in public health policy, particularly focused in nutrition, physical activity, alcohol, tobacco, and uh, on cancers, particularly, and also other chronic disease issues. With her great experience in policy, she's the ideal final speaker today to really tie in all of what uh, we've heard so far about the dietary patterns, or the policy implications of dietary patterns. So the title of her talk is Policy Implications of Dietary Pattern Research and Practice. I'm Melissa, I look forward to your talk. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're watching from. My name is Melissa Maiden Shepherd, and the title of my presentation today is Policy Implications of Dietary Pattern Research and Practice. 
My presentation will be a little bit different from Dr. Fong's and Dr. Tabong's uh, because I'm not a researcher or a clinician. I'm a policy analyst and an advocate. So I'm going to be talking about why public policy is important, why you all as researchers and clinicians should care about public policy. I'll talk about AICR's federal public policy priorities. And then finally, I'll end with why and how cancer researchers and clinicians should be advocates. So first, why public policy? So public policy is a way to amplify the impact of your research. And research has shown that laws and policies at all levels of government can make it easier or can make it more difficult for people to make healthy choices that impact their cancer risk. So for example, think about the nutritional quality of the food that's available in schools and work sites and communities. Think about the nutrition labels that you see when you're eating out or shopping for food. Those are all influenced by public policy. And research points to the need for policy systems and environmental changes as key to shaping people's behaviors as they relate to diet and weight. And I'll also point out that it's important to note that the federal government is the largest funder of cancer research in the US. And while AICR has amazingly dedicated nearly $110 million to research, the AICR's ability to invest in research pales in comparison to the resources of the federal government. Then the, the amount that the federal government spends on uh, research related to cancer and related to uh, diet quality is determined by uh, public policy decisions. So this is the CDC's social ecological model as it relates to nutrition and diet quality. I'm not going to go through all the details here, but I will highlight that there are four layers of the model. Then they, they range from micro level factors to macro level factors. So micro being more downstream interpersonal, interpersonal factors and macro level factors being more upstream focused on public policy. And while much of AICR's work to educate the public and healthcare providers is focused on those more interpersonal, intrapersonal factors, the public policy work that we're engaged in is more upstream at the macro level. But this is a theory of change demonstrating how AICR's public policy work ultimately impacts cancer risk through diet, physical activity, and body weight. And research influences every step of the process. So everything that AICR advocates for is evidence-based. So you'll see research then influences, hopefully, public policy change. Then that public policy change influences people's information about what choices to make. It may influence their access to healthy foods. It may influence what's being marketed. And then these, these factors then influence people's behaviors in terms of what they actually eat which influences their overall diet and their diet quality, which may also influence their body weight and their cancer risk. So as you can see, it's, it, there are many steps along the way, but, but evidence-based public policies do have an impact on diet and body weight and ultimately cancer risk. And research is key to informing this entire process. So this is an example uh, of how updates to the nutrition facts label, which is a policy change that ASCR has advocated for, ultimately impact cancer risk through improved diet and body weight. So one spe a specific update to the nutrition facts label was the addition of added sugars content. So at a high level, this addition helped to increase consumer awareness about the need to limit added sugars and about the health impact of intake of added sugars. It also led to increased availability of lower sugar items, as well as incentives for production of lower sugar items. All of these taken together led to reduced intake of added sugars, or hopefully at least that's the goal we're moving towards, uh, which would then lead to improved diet quality, a healthy body weight, and lower cancer risk. So I'm now going to provide an overview of AICR's five policy priority areas, and you'll see several of them relate to diet quality. So these are the five policy priorities, uh, dietary guidelines, nutrition alcohol labeling, cancer survivorship, research funding, and physical activity. 
But AICR has supported updated nutrition facts label to add added sugars, as I mentioned, and has been engaged with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for the last few years on their nutrition initiative. We're also proactively calling for the addition of a whole grain label to food packages to support people eating more whole grains to reduce the risk of colorectal cancer. But right now, there's no way for consumers to know if there's a product, a grain-based product that has part refined grain and part whole grain. There's no way for consumers to know what portion of that is whole grain versus refined grain. So we'd like to change that by adding whole grain content to the label. There's a bill that's been introduced in the current Congress called the Food Labeling Modernization Act that would do that. And AICR has been engaged in um, ensuring that that bill moves forward and includes that the whole grain labeling component. Also with respect to nutrition labeling, um, we see that there are some loopholes in the labeling of alcoholic beverages. So alcoholic beverages are regulated differently than non-alcoholic beverages and other foods, and they don't require the same nutrition labels as food packages, despite their often providing significant calories in addition to their alcohol content. So AICR is advocating for those loopholes to be closed, and we're also advocating for the addition of a cancer label to educate about the relationship between alcohol and cancer. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit further. So AICR's research has found, and you know, we've heard also from Dr. Fong and Dr. Fong about the relationship between alcohol and cancer um, and about the role of alcohol in dietary patterns. So there are at least six cancer types that where there is strong evidence that alcohol increases the risk including three cancer types where any amount of alcohol may increase cancer risk. And so coupled with that strong evidence, uh, we also have research from AICR's latest consumer survey, which has found that less than half of the population has any idea that there's a connection between alcohol and cancer. So we joined with several other groups, including the Consumer Federation of America and the Center for Science and the Public Interest, to advocate for an update to the label on alcoholic beverages to add a cancer warning. And as you can see, the first two statements here that say government warning are what's on the current label. The third one is what we would be proposing to add. So we've previously sent a letter to the US uh, Tobacco Trade Bureau, which is the group that, that has regulatory authority over alcoholic beverages. Uh, we've also sent a letter to the Surgeon General that has a role in these updates. And we're also now working to introduce a bill in Congress and finding some congressional champions for this initiative. Our next priority area is the US dietary guidelines. And by law, the dietary guidelines must be updated every five years and all federal food and nutrition policies, programs and messaging must promote the dietary guidelines. So given the importance of them, AICR was closely engaged in advocating that the 2020 to 2025 dietary guidelines, which were just released last December, align with AICR's research related to dietary patterns in cancer and to alcohol and cancer. Overall, the dietary guidelines, the, the final version, do largely align with AICR's cancer prevention recommendations, although there were a couple areas, specifically alcohol and added sugars, that were not as strong as AICR's research would support. Um, when these dietary guidelines were released at the end of last year, AICR was able to leverage attention to the recommendations related to alcohol specifically and to the relationship between dietary patterns and cancer and was able to reach a broad audience with AICR's message. Uh, more than 620 million people may have seen uh, media impressions related to AICR's engagement on alcohol and the dietary guidelines. And there was a session uh, in January of this year during AICR's symposium that focused specifically on the dietary guidelines and the ways that they do and do not align with AICR's cancer prevention recommendations. So if you're interested in more detail, um, you can take a look at the recording from that session. Uh, with respect to cancer survivors, AICR is interested in increasing access to lifestyle interventions for people with cancer. On the nutrition side, we have the Medical Nutrition Therapy Act, which is federal legislation to provide Medicare coverage for medical nutrition therapy, which is a type of nutrition counseling for people with chronic conditions, including cancer. 
And given that the bill would provide coverage for medical nutrition therapy for a range of chronic conditions, we're working with a broad coalition of nutrition and health advocates to try to pass this bill. And it has been introduced in the current Congress in both the House and the Senate. On the physical activity side, uh, we're working to support cancer survivors and making physical activity part of the standard of care for people with cancer through the Moving Through Cancer Initiative that's led by Dr. Katie Schmitz, who provided more detail about this initiative in her session. We're also working with a coalition of partners, including through the One Voice Against Cancer Coalition, to increase federal funding for cancer research at the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute. So while the federal fiscal year 2022 officially began on October 1st of this year, uh, the funding bill has not been passed and there is a continuing resolution that is in place through December 3rd. For fiscal year 2022, AICR, as part of the One Voice Against Cancer Coalition, has asked for a $9 billion increase in funding for the National Institutes of Health, which is consistent with what the president's budget has requested, and an increase of a little bit over $1 billion for the National Cancer Institute. And as I said right now, even though we're officially in fiscal year 2022, given that there is this continuing resolution, there is still an opportunity to increase what the final federal funding levels will be for FY22. I want to talk for a minute about ARPA-H. You may or may not have heard about it. It stands for the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health. And there's a, this is a proposal for a new research initiative within the federal government uh, to operate within HHS or within the NIH specifically. Uh, this proposal comes all the way from the top, from President Biden. In his joint address to Congress earlier this year, which was one of the most important speeches of his presidency so far, uh, he mentioned this new initiative, the new ARPA-H. He has called for a new agency to develop breakthroughs to prevent, detect, and treat diseases such as cancer and wants to end cancer as we know it. So this is a priority for the administration all the way up to the top. So I'll share a little bit about what we know about ARPA-H, and I'm happy to talk more about this during the Q&A if there are questions. Um, my understanding is it's a new way of doing business. It's focused on high-risk, high-reward culture. Uh, they'll be looking to fund use-driven solutions to practical problems that advance health equity and drive innovation. As this is a brand new initiative, it has not yet been established. Um, before it can be created, uh, Congress needs to pass legislation both to authorize the initiative, to set it up, and to appropriate funding. So to determine how much money it's going to have to implement its goals. So there are existing proposals, both authorizing legislation and, as well as funding proposals for ARPA-H for fiscal year 22. So while this hasn't happened yet, I do expect that, uh, that we will see ARPA-H underway in the next fiscal year. So AICR is monitoring this closely and has recommended at a high level that investment in ARPA-H supplement rather than supplant base funding for NIH. So we don't want money for this being taken away from NCI, for example. And we also want to ensure that uh, ARPA-H funding can be used for research related to cancer prevention and healthy lifestyles, the type of work that you all do. So we will be providing updates as we learn more over the next fiscal year, but I thought this might be something that you all would be interested in. So I'm going to touch very briefly on physical activity, which I understand uh, is not part of dietary patterns, but it is our fifth priority area, and AICR is part of the leadership of the Physical Activity Alliance, which is a broad coalition of nonprofit provider industry and other stakeholders. We're working within this coalition to better integrate physical activity within the healthcare system and across the federal government and advocate for legislation that would require updates to the physical activity guidelines every 10 years, which are similar to the dietary guidelines, except they're focused on physical activity, but there is not that mandate that they be updated like there is for the dietary guidelines. So finally, I'm going to close with some information about why and how you can be an advocate. So cancer researchers and clinicians 
are excellent advocates. And there are several reasons for this. So first, you're often leaders in the community. You may work at large anchor institutions. You may receive federal funding for your work. And then most importantly, you have a story to tell about your research and what the impact has been or what the impact could be of additional funding. So do you know who your members of Congress are? So if not, the first step is you can go to the website here on congress.gov. You type in your home address and then you will find your members of Congress. Uh, you may also want to look into who your state and local elected officials are as well, because they also make important policy decisions. So if you happen to live at AICR's office, here is who your members of Congress would be. Everyone, except if you live in DC or US territory has one representative and two senators. Uh, you can see here if you uh, follow the links uh, to the names of the members of Congress that will take you to their website. You can also see uh, where their offices are located if you happen to be in DC and want to visit them. Um, and you can also find their phone numbers here, which you may want to take note of. So there are three easy ways to contact your member of Congress. So uh, this is not difficult, everyone can do it. Uh, so first, uh, pick up the phone. I just shared how you can find their phone number. Uh, if you call the office of your member of Congress, ask to speak to their health staffer. Uh, tell them when you talk to them, tell them your constituent, tell them where you live, not necessarily your exact address, but tell them you know, what city or town you live in, tell them what neighborhood you live in, tell them where you work, your institution, and then tell them why the issues that they're working on matter to you and to others in your district. And finally, you can also let them know that you're a resource. So if they're working on something related to cancer, let them know that they can call you or email you and that you can be a resource to them. Uh, in addition to calling them, you can send them an email. So if you call them and you speak to a health staffer, you may want to find out the name and the email address of the health staffer, and then you can follow up by email. Again, when you email them, make sure that they know your constituent and where you live. Um, and this is an easy way to share new research that you have when it's published. Uh, make sure though, when you're emailing them, keep in mind that they are not researchers and not clinicians for the most part. So use lay friendly language and talk about what the impact is of your work. And then finally, most members of Congress are on social media. So you can tag them on Twitter. You can tweet at them. You can publicly thank them for their leadership if they have uh, taken an important vote or they've introduced legislation or taken action on something that is important to you. You can publicly thank them. And you can also publicly ask for their support in that way. So social media, if you're active on social media, is another great way to engage with your members of Congress. And since we've just talked about how to contact the members of Congress, I'd like to close with something that you all can do today, something you can contact your members of Congress about. So as I mentioned, the fiscal year 2022 appropriation season is still underway. So after this session, please consider contacting your members of Congress, ask them to support increases in funding for the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute. Um, and I've included here what the asks are for the next fiscal year. So nearly $9 billion increase for NIH, um, a little over a $1 billion increase for NPI. And importantly, when you contact them, tell them about your NIH funded research and tell them about why more research funding is needed. What would you be able to do with that work at your institution in your district? And what might the impact be uh, for the population at large? This is really important for members of Congress to understand what the impact would be on their district and their constituents of increased federal funding for cancer research. And just to keep in mind again, that congressional staff are not clinicians for the most part, and they're not scientists, they are educated, uh, but just make sure that you're keeping communications with them on a level that they can understand and doesn't get too into the technical details, but they still understand what the impact is of your work and what you're focused on. And finally, for more information, if you would like more details about our policy work, uh, you can visit AICR's public policy booth on the conference website. You can also uh, visit AICR's public website. There is a section focused on policy and advocacy. You can email uh, advocacy at AICR.org. 
And if you'd like to contact me directly, I have included my email address here as well. So thank you very much and look forward to receiving your questions. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Uh, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm sure everyone enjoyed the uh, three fantastic talks uh, from different perspectives. Um, I, I think they were very informative and, and, uh, and interesting. Um, we've, we've gotten uh, a lot of questions, so I think uh, I'm excited to start uh, this uh, uh, question and answer session. Um, and so I'll, I'll start. So um, th this one, um, I guess anyone can answer, but it's probably directed more to Fred or Teresa, Teresa certainly can, uh, Melissa can jump in. So uh, Fred, in, in uh, the 2018 WCRF AICR third Ex expert report examined the evidence for dietary patterns um, and cancer risk and concluded that the evidence was too scarce to draw conclusions. And so for you know, the 2018 report, the data essentially up to around 2016, um, I, I know you're, you're well up in the field, like when do you think, or if and when, there'll be enough evidence from uh, cohort studies primarily uh, that will be able to make direct recommendations based on the dietary patterns of uh, literature. Thanks, Ed, and uh, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. yes, I can. Um, thank you. Um, I, I feel that the evidence for some cancers um, that we do have, um, the evidence will not be the same for all cancer sites. Um, Cancer sites like the colorectal, breast, and, and lung, I feel that we do have um, adequate amount of evidence from, especially from, um, from cohort studies. The review that we conducted in 2017 identified almost 50 studies, about a half of them were uh, from cohort studies. And the, the, uh, that was in relation to one cancer site, colorectal cancer. And the evidence was quite consistent. I feel that, that um, maybe the conclusion of uh, inadequate evidence uh, from the uh, WCR ICR uh, report in 2018 was could probably have been due to lack of the framework that I hope the um, the dietary patterns work stream that uh, was put together would would be able to I mean has provided a framework that uh, the current evidence can be. Uh, that can be used to analyze the current evidence. And uh, hopefully we should be able to uh, begin to see clearer trends um, uh, in the evidence when that has been um, um, uh, adopted and used. Uh, and the good thing with uh, the work that WCR AICR is doing is that it is updated uh, continuously so that for uh, cancer sites that may not have enough evidence after about five to 10 years, that evidence is updated with uh, newly published studies and uh, can continue to make evidence on that. So for um, long breast and, and, um, and colorectal, I feel that the evidence is uh, uh, adequate, especially for prospective cohort studies. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, th thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, 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 that's, that's important. important. Yeah, just uh, I think uh, not everyone may know, as Fred mentioned, the AICR is uh, working, uh, has a special uh, working group that you know, Fred contributed to uh, on, on framing, on framing of working. Well, um, um, I hear my, my audio is not good. Let me, uh, 
uh, I'll get back on. So, Teresa, do you, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I agree with Fred that one very important thing is that this is going to be site specific. And so, and I also agree with Fred that breast and colorectal cancer, we have quite a good amount of data to start making recommendations for it already. Um, and when it comes to recommendation, it, it, is, it is going to be about how specific the recommendations can it be. Hello, um, is my audio better? Oh, great, okay, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, uh, so I didn't, I didn't get your, your whole um, answer, uh, Teresa, but I heard that you agreed with Fred, so I'll go along with that. Okay. Uh, an another question, uh, and I guess this could also be for Fred or Teresa. Um, uh, in, in uh, I mean, dietary patterns, uh, you know, we're all advocates here to some degree, uh, uh, but th there are challenges in the field, like, um, I mean, do you think the field needs more standardization at this point? A, uh, a nutrient is a nutrient and it's transferable across populations, but uh, like when can we call, for example, a dietary pattern Mediterranean? Uh, is, is a Mediterranean diet the same across all populations or, or you know, plant-based, as, as Fred noted in his last talk, not all plant-based diets may be uh, um, the same, um, and so, like, is, like, what do you do? You think that uh, people should just keep doing research as they're doing, or should there be like some really strong statements on how research should be done in dietary patterns? Maybe Teresa, okay. you can. I can get started. Yeah, I can get get started, and then I can jump in. So there's two perspective. One is the um, research perspective. And so with the different namings and all the same naming with the different contents of the diet that does make uh, comparing different studies rather difficult uh, because we always have to go back to the details of what exactly people are eating and how much they're eating for each food component as well. So that, that area is, is uh, more difficult. However, are we able to standardize? I mean, is it, it's logistically, can we actually say that this is what the prudent pattern is. And unless your population eats to that particular level, then we cannot call it prudent pattern. That is, I think it is going to be um, trying to get a coordinated amount the international research community. I think that is going to be a logistical, you know, quite, quite a complex uh, uh, process to do that. So I'm not sure if that how practical it is. So yes, but but I agree that in terms of the research area, that is going to be very complicated in terms of trying to it, standardization would be good. It is really possible. I don't know. From the practical perspective, from a practice perspective, in terms of giving recommendations, Fred actually have shown some data that show that the details might not be so necessary. Yes, we want evidence-based practice and we all do evidence-based practice, but the different ways of defining different diets we still see inverse associations as long as the diets has fits generally within certain um, definitions. So in that case, in terms of the practical area, I think that the standardization is not as critical as if it is in the research area. Fred, what do you think? Yeah, for Fred or Completely Melissa? Agree. Okay, uh, so, okay. Um, I had it. Yeah. Uh, Maybe this is sort of a related question, uh, uh, maybe Teresa, uh, because you talk, I was interested about your mention of the uh, global dietary score, GDS. Um, um, you know, to me, that seems uh, an, an important project, uh, but also quite challenging that, uh, you know, different diets and different people and in different regions are, are, you know, diets in different regions much. are quite Diverse and very different. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah, and, and sometimes I mean, even within a region, even yeah, the, yeah. within a region, the rural versus urban areas in some parts of the world, they are, are very different in terms of what they eat. Yeah, so yeah. it was it was definitely challenging. We were working with uh, several different data sets, not only the U.S. data sets, but also a Mexico Mexican data set, a Chinese data set, an Indian data set, and several data sets from Africa. And so, yes, we achieved the global part, but trying to harmonize those were actually quite challenging. We have a lot of discussions among the team in terms of fitting into food groups because the GDQS is 25 food groups. And so in terms of placing individual 
food components into it, it was quite a bit of discussion. So for example, um, there were no insects food group in the GDQS, all those insects was actually, is, was a meaningful amount of intake in some, in some areas. And, but it's not meaningful in some other parts of the world, we actually don't have a specific insects group. And we then therefore have to decide where to put those, where to put the insects. So we eventually actually turn the poultry group. So we have the red meat, we have red meat group, we have a processing group, but we actually turn the poultry group and a separate fish group. And then they turn the poultry group into the generally healthy, high protein animal products group that turns out what it turns out to be with, you know, with poultry, game meats, as well as um, and insects. And we have to do that. And definitely compromise. We are, you know, there is not one ideal way of categorizing um, for the entire world because in different regions, their nutrients of concerns and the food of concerns are different. So in the US, if you're asking me, I would really put a very low priority score, very low for people who eat a lot of red meat. However, in some parts of the world, that is a very important source of iron and protein. And so we ended up for some food components, we ended up taking the middle row, some compromise, actually we made some compromise. So the, so the GDQS is not gonna be the ideal scores for some outcomes. Um, but it, it hopefully is work well enough so that we have something actually standardized, talking about standardizing for the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thanks for sharing your experience. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, anyone else has other thoughts about that. Or... Yeah, um, and just... I, um... oh, okay. go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Uh, Melissa can go first and Fred. M Melissa? I just add from a policy perspective, so, so policy is not about specifying exactly what, what food someone can or cannot eat. It's about creating, increasing awareness and providing parameters or incentives for production or consumption of foods that are broadly part of a healthy dietary pattern. So, you know, I think it's important to think about it. It might not matter, you know, what there are very different, as, as we can tell, differences across culture and, and dietary pattern. But overall, if we're thinking about you know, increasing focus on fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, lean, unprocessed meats, you know, those are the components of dietary pattern that they're consistent across AICR's recommendations, as well as the dietary guidelines. And so those are the dietary components that, at least in public policy work, and um, as far as the broad understanding of the evidence that we're looking to emphasize. Great. Uh, Fred, were you going to say anything? No, I was just uh, going to say I completely agree with, um, uh, with, with Teresa. Um, and I like that Teresa separated out you know, looking at the research aspect, standardizing, um, you know, in relation to uh, research methodology and the practical aspect of, uh, 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 of it. And in, in research, we want to be as perfect as we can be, but uh, there are these natural differences that um, natural differences in food availability based on climate and, and culture and, um, and several things that just makes food types across the different regions different and so it can be very difficult to um, um, uh, uh, to standardize but from a practical perspective we can still be able to make dietary guidance based on the research that is conducted uh, across the different regions of the world and um, Teresa has really done great work here she has made great strides with the with the global dietary score um, one advantage of the index-based course is that we start off with a predefined set of, uh, of components and then, you know, look to calc um, look at available dietary data and uh, calculate the score based on the available dietary data. Uh, one project that um, I'm collaborating with uh, Mary Playdon from University of uh, Utah is we are looking to calculate the ED, the, the EDIP score and the EDI scores that I, I, I briefly mentioned. Those scores, though they are uh, population specific, but we come up with a, a predefined set of components. 
so you can think of it as data driven, but it has a, a predefined set of components, which can be uh, then be operationalized similar to um, um, similar to the to the traditional index based uh, uh, scores. And we are now looking in different countries. Uh, there's a project supported by the American Cancer Society that um, um, that we are looking to operationalize these scores across different countries. And um, the challenges that we are experiencing are quite enormous. That um, we started off with a predefined set of food groups and then looking in the different food frequency questionnaires in the different countries to see what uh, available food data is there and categorizing these foods in the food groups. And there are those natural differences across uh, different regions and countries that, uh, uh, that we are encountering. So in terms of standardization, we might not be able to really achieve that, but um, going forward, we might be able to come up with a predefined set of food groups to say that um, maybe assessing, because you know, dietary patterns are operationalized from existing uh, dietary data that is assessed from food frequency questionnaires or food records or 24 hour uh, uh, dietary recalls. And so probably we could start to improve um, some level of standardization through the original assessment of the diet in the first place. Great, thank, thank you Fred. Um, I, I wanted to get to a, a few questions uh, from, from the audience. Um, uh, th there's a question from uh, Karen Collins, uh, and this is uh, following up on uh, uh, Teresa's description of scores. Uh, uh, Teresa, what are the implications for dietary pattern scores that score intake relative to others in a, in a study sample versus relative to predefined uh, standards? That's right, yeah. When it is, um, if the scoring is relative to study sample, then it first off the bat is already population difference. Um, somebody who, it, it, two people who eat the same quantity of a particular food group. But if that one person is in a country that the intake is generally low, then that person will score very high on that component. But another person who eats the exact same quantity but that person lives in a country that eats very high quantities of that. And that person actually may end up on the low end relatively in that particular country. So the same quantity could get people into different score level depending on what is the background intake of, of the population. So comparison you know, across data sets is gonna be difficult on that. And with the range of the, uh, of the intake is gonna be difficult on that. And therefore, um, Research-wise, therefore, we're looking at, into a relative comparison, relative risk situation when you're in a high intake in a particular population comparing a low intake with respect to that particular um, population. So we are looking, so becomes, then we are looking into a spectrum of intake in, in that way when it comes to research. And now the implication when it comes to research is um, depending on how a particular, the investigators of a particular data set handle things. If there are more than one measurement of the diet in time, across different times, people's intake can change, the population intake can change. And so therefore the cutoff, that median cutoff can change across time. If everybody eats, if everybody improves their intake across time, then the cutoff becomes getting higher and higher as time goes on. And it takes more and more intake in order to get a high, um, high score. And so even if a person improves their intake, the increase in score is not going to show up over time unless this person's intake increase more than what the general public in the data set was increasing when, because everything is comparing with what the rest of the population. Is. So therefore noting changes in across, in across time in the population might be more difficult when it comes to this relative color. So it is, it is an issue. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, th that's, uh, thanks Teresa. That's, that's a very interesting answer. Uh, did, does uh, Fred or Melissa want to add to that or? I think you were quite clear <laughs> on, on answering that. Uh, I wanted to have, uh, there's a question here uh, uh, directed to Melissa. Um, uh, the question is, what, uh, there's no name, what, what can people who want to get involved more directly with AICR's policy work do? 
Oh, thanks, Dr. Giovinici. That's a great question. And I touched on this briefly in my presentation, but happy to highlight a few opportunities. So first, if you have not yet taken a look at the AICR conference booth, there is an advocacy booth there. And we have put a few resources that may be of interest. So there's a backgrounder on AICR's five policy priorities. So that's an opportunity to learn more. Um, there is a guide for co contacting your members of Congress. Um, if it's not something that you have done or done frequently or feel comfortable with, um, these are just some tips for how you can contact your member um, via phone, via email, via social media. And then also there's a script. So as I mentioned, there is an opportunity to influence policy decisions right now related to federal funding for um, overall biomedical research and cancer research specifically um, at NIH and NCI through the upcoming fiscal year 2022 appropriations process. So even though we're in Fiscal year 2022, the funding decisions have not yet been made. There's a continuing resolution through the beginning of December that's likely to be extended until later in December. So there is an opportunity for the next several weeks for you to contact your members of Congress to let them know that you support increases in federal funding for NIH and NCI. And on those documents, there is a specific script that you can use to advocate um, so feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. And then also um, you can email us. Um, AICR's advocacy email address is advocacy at AICR.org. Pretty simple. Um, advocacy at AICR.org. So if you have any questions, email us. If you took action, email us, let us know. Then we'll know that you took action, we might be able to follow up. And then also sometimes there are other opportunities where we would like to engage a subset of AICR researchers, perhaps to nominate someone for a federal advisory committee or to participate in a lobby day or to serve in an internal AICR advisory group related to policy. So we'd love to know um, it, for those of you who are interested in those types of opportunities, then email us and let us know. You know let us know what your specific areas of expertise are, where you might be particularly interested in, in getting engaged. Um, maybe let us know where you're located if we if AICR doesn't already have that information so we can match you to who your members of Congress are or let us know who your members of Congress are um, and let us know what types of opportunities you'd be interested in. So those are a few ways to get involved. Um, if you have never contacted your member of Congress before, it's really easy. It, it doesn't take a lot of time to use the script that we have to write a quick email or make a quick phone call. If you don't know who your members of Congress are, you can find them on the congress.gov website, the link that's shared and it's on those resources as well. So we really um, hope that you'd be willing to just take a few minutes and it's in your interest um, for and NIH and NCI to increase their funding for cancer research because that helps to support your work and provide more funding for the field at large. Thanks, thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Melissa. That's very useful information, and I'm, I'm always for more funding for research. Uh, obviously, um, so. Uh, I'll go back to the um, uh, questions. Uh, here's an, a question, uh, no name, but I think this is probably Fred can take the first stab, but any, you know, e either, uh, every, anyone is uh, welcome to answer. Is what is the potential future role of metabolomics data in dietary pattern uh, modeling? I know if you've done work in this, Fred, so I thought you might be the yeah. right yeah. person to start. <laughs> Um, I, I think metabolomic has, uh, uh, like other omics, has a major role um, to help in clarifying uh, potential biological mechanisms that might underlie the role of diet in cancer prevention and control and also other uh, health outcomes. Um, this is a very active area of research right now. Uh, a lot of people are working on this and um, the methods are, are becoming more and more clearer, but it is, we still have a lot to, a lot of unanswered questions in terms of methodology, like um, um, what type of metabolomics data to use? Um, is it the qualitative data, um, abundances, 
of metabolite or more quantitative data. Um, you know, um, whether we can um, arrive at specific um, uh, metabolite biomarkers of specific foods. Um, uh, some review papers are coming up with more consistent um, links between specific metabolites and specific foods. Um, uh, and so I think this is a very promising area um, to begin to elucidate potential mechanisms uh, that may underlie the role of diet in uh, uh, especially in, in, in cancer. So uh, it's, it's a very promising area. The, 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 the project that I previously mentioned um, that I'm collaborating with Peter Playton, we are incorporating uh, metabolomics data, um, um, you know, integrating metabolomics data with, um, uh, with dietary data to begin to see which metabolomic profiles uh, is associated with uh, some of these dietary patterns. Um, I think it might be difficult to come up with is in terms of specificity to be able to say this specific um, uh, metabolomic profile is um, can predict uh, one specific dietary pattern, but um, inroads are also being made in that in that direction. Whereby um, uh, I think a group out of uh, the UK is working on this, trying to come up with. Uh, a metabolomic profile that could reflect uh, a Western dietary pattern or a prudent dietary pattern. Uh, so I think that the data uh, is really promising in this area. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's I, yeah, I'm thinking on the opposite direction of the, of the cause and effect. I was thinking that can we use diet to predict a metabolomic profile? And especially when it comes to a metabolic profile um, that is predictive of certain cancer outcome or particular mechanism uh, in, in cancer development. So, so what I'm gonna say now is, is really out in the future, maybe a little bit on, on the fantasy side of things is, is that now if we are able to find a dietary profile that predicts metabolic profile that is related to a particular cancer mechanism, can we use that to couple that on cancer treatment? Can, it, can, can diet become an adjuvant therapy for certain diet chemotherapies or, or cancer chemotherapy or, or some, some other thing? So in, in terms of treatment, that's, that's, not, my, that's not my area. Um, so for those, those of us and those of you who are actually in, in working in cancer treatment, um, I was wondering if there's the potential to go that direction. Yeah, yeah I think that's a fascinating um, comment. Uh, um, I, I'm not sure if there's much work in that. Um, yeah. In fact, is that too far fetched like, right, right now? You know. <laughs> well, you know, like uh, actually, the, the next question uh, I was going to ask, you know, might be uh, relevant. The, the the question, uh, and again, there's there's no name, but uh, this is from someone in the audience. What type of uh, AI or machine learning is used to to date for dietary patterns, and what's the potential for uh, AI or artificial intelligence in this area of research. So, so maybe there is some way that we can link AI to, you know, to, to match these different profiles because uh, they they all have their own complexities. I mean, metabolomics by itself is very complex. And then when we start, you know, adding complex dietary patterns to that and then to disease risk, it gets really a bit overwhelming. So, so we have to think of new, uh, Approaches. So I don't know if, if anybody has any comments on that. I, I, I know very little about uh, AI, but so. Uh, yeah, in terms of AI, um, I've seen some groups um, apply AI methods to the metabolomics data, like graphical methods, uh, topographical networking and net you know to piece up the uh, metabolites into um, into networks um, and then examine those network the modules that come out of that in, uh, in, 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 in relation to disease outcomes. Uh, but I've also seen some people apply those similar methods, AI methods to um, to derive dietary patterns. 
And um, these are really, they look really nice, but the question I, I always ask, uh, you know, especially in relation to the, um, to the dietary patterns uh, side is, what question is the method addressing more broadly? Because approaching it that way helps me to think through the, um, the interpretation of findings and potential translation. Uh, and also ask the question, what is the AI method doing differently than the existing methods? Is it advancing us, you know, helping to um, overcome some of the challenges that we currently face with dietary pattern methods? Um, so those are some of the, uh, the questions that I would ask, but I've seen some people use AI methods that look really novel. Um, but yeah, in terms of really making inroads into uh, overcoming some of the challenges, I'm not sure. That's yeah, right. and that's uh, right. Go ahead. Uh, and that's especially if the AI is helpful in also the practical side of it is the translational. Can we use AI to come up with some way that we can quickly identify some recommendations that we can also give to the general public? Yeah, yeah. Um, another area. Uh, That's right. And maybe the microbiome area is, is one, one part that can, you know, between you know, AI metabolomics and using diet to, to um, influence cancer outcome or using us a, to, to work accordingly with, with other therapy method, maybe the, the microbiome, maybe it's an, an area because we do, um, maybe that is the area that is a little bit more advanced than others in terms of finding, in, in terms of pointing, pinpointing mechanism as well as making recommendations. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, apologize for, for that glitch. Uh, um, hopefully, I'm more audible. Um, I just uh, we're yeah we're getting close to the end. Uh, I just had uh, one one question on. Uh, I think uh, Teresa or, or somehow mentioned a keto diet, ketogenic diet, and also uh, like I guess the the field of chronobiology, like timing of eating. yeah, yeah. Th those are very potentially very important for cancer um, and health in general. But how, how do you think we're going to get like data, like in terms of there, there there are probably not enough people that in the conventional cohort studies that we follow uh, that, that are having this very specific diet over a long period of time. So it's gonna be hard to get direct data on the diet and the cancer outcome, but are there are other ways that we can get uh, information that's relevant for cancer. Will we ever be able to say anything? No, and it is precisely because of what you said that people for these popular diets, people go on them for a short period of time and they adhere to it at different levels. So it is difficult to quantify, difficult to define. And so these, these popular diets have, have variations. Um, and so therefore, in terms of core data, it's really difficult to do research when especially cancer outcomes that takes a long time to show up. And this might be an area that you know animal studies and short-term studies looking at intermediate markers that might be it's going to be what is going to give us at least some data um, to work with as work with maybe that's that's the only way we can we can go. If I could add from the consumer perspective, I think that while there are challenges, it sounds like methodological challenges with making really strong evidence-based recommendations, these are the questions that consumers have and the, these are the things that, that they want to know and, and they're gonna seek out information wherever they can find it. So if there are not evidence-based recommendations from the experts, they're gonna look to social media, their friends, the popular yeah. press and what, they may be getting from these sources is may or may not be evidence-based and certainly is probably not, you know, what, what you all, you know, may want them to hear. So, you know, I think to the extent that 
we can give consumers guidance as to what we know and what we don't know. And you know, maybe we don't know about the keto diet specifically, but maybe there are things that we could imply as potentially uh, relevant, you know, based on existing evidence on other dietary patterns. So I think that the more we can experts can can be clear about what the evidence is and is not, um, the more it will be helpful for consumers who are going to seek information wherever they can get it. Yeah, I think yeah. that's yeah. yeah. um, definitely I, an issue. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You go, you go ahead. I talk too much. No, no, no. Go ahead, Teresa. No. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So the, I think the communications, and it brings to the importance of the work that AICR does in terms of communications to the to the general public as well, is to tell them what we know, what we don't know. Another thing is that people get on these diets for a purpose. They want to accomplish something, be it weight loss, disease prevention, that kind of thing. So even if we cannot tell them what whether these diets are going to accomplish what they want to accomplish, we can actually suggest them, well, we know of all the other dietary patterns can actually accomplish what you want to accomplish. That has more evidence base. Right. So that might be a, one direction of communication. Absolutely. Good. Did you want to say anything? Yeah. I just wanted to add. Go ahead, Fred. Oh, yeah. sorry. No, I just I just wanted to add relative to the ketogenic diet that um, uh, studies of short duration of a couple of weeks to a couple of months do show um, uh, an effect on 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 weight loss, but um, long term studies really haven't been conducted, and um, current efforts in that direction are based on. Um, using like the ketogenic ratio of macronutrients that really doesn't take into consideration the context in which the nutrients are consumed and calculating the ketogenic ratios and uh, to simulate the ketogenic diet or the low carbo carbohydrate dietary score that have been uh, applied in the Harvard cohorts and found to be um, associated with uh, higher risk of type two diabetes. So it seems like the duration of the ketogenic diet modifies the effect of the diet with uh, short-term studies showing a favorable effect and long-term studies based on these course not showing a very um, good effect of the diet. Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, those are great, great points. Uh, uh, well, I'd like to thank everyone. The, the, uh, the session is over, uh, but uh, people don't, don't all leave. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers for the great uh, uh, commentary and, and uh, question and answer session, uh, but th there is a closing, uh, a few closing remarks from AICR. So when, when, when I stop talking, don't, don't leave uh, right away, but I'd like to thank everyone. And I thought this was in a great uh, session to end a great conference. Thank everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nigel Brockton. I'm the Vice President of Research at the American Institute for Cancer Research. And it's my pleasure to thank you all for attending this incredible conference. Delivering this conference has been a bit of a Herculean task. It's involved three plans, two years and, and one pandemic, but it's definitely been worth the wait. We really have to thank the conference committee for delivering such an outstanding conference on behalf of both myself and everyone at the American Institute for Cancer Research to our conference committee who delivered this outstanding experience for everyone. Dr. Wendy DeMart Wonderfried and Dr. Ed Giovannucci were our chairs and they really steered this whole process. Dr. Eric Nelson, Dr. Catherine Schmitz, Dr. Jeffrey Meyerhart, Dr. Melissa Hudson and Dr. Neil Iyengar. They all contributed their incredible, unique expertise that really formed the, the diversity and richness of this whole conference and thank them so very much. In normal life, we would make them stand up in the middle of the auditorium to accept the applause. But if you'd like to just clap in your own homes or your, your offices uh, to acknowledge their fantastic input.
we started with the strength of evidence session on Monday, the 1st of November. Uh, seems a long time ago now. And Doris Chan presented the, the vision for the cup. And Edgy Avanushi gave us a, a masterpiece discussing the roles of, of observational and clinical trial evidence. And really, this is the, the evidence that underlines everything that we do in our research and how we advise patients in the population about lifestyle factors. Our next session was the role of lifestyle in immunotherapy, which is obviously a, a very innovative form of treatment, but lifestyle can have a big impact on which patient that therapy works for. The next session was then about lifestyle manipulation of the tumor microenvironment. So again, these really tangible factors and how lifestyle affects cancer development and outcomes. We then had cancers on the rise. The cancers that were discussed all have a lifestyle component in development and survival. And these are cancers that are increasing in number and lifestyle gives us one option to, to reduce the burden of those cancers. Then our final plenary session was what can we tell our patients? We had four presentations that really presented what we can tell our patients and how we need to go about it. And then we had an incredible, almost an hour of discussion, which the silver lining of being virtual is that all of this content is available online and you can go back in on demand, review these, these presentations, and really mine this rich content that was presented over the course of the conference. The downside of the virtual platform is the lack of networking, but it was amazing in the poster sessions to see how much interaction there was through the chat and the rooms. And actually, even during the, the sessions, you may not have realized that the, a lot of the talks were pre-recorded, so the speakers were in a sort of back-end Zoom uh, before the, the discussion phase, having discussions. And it was amazing to see actually collaborations being set up in these back-end Zooms like you would in an in-person conference. So yes, we are all eager to get back to in-person conferences, but I think the speakers and the committee and everyone that attended and asked questions really contributed to this being such a rich experience. Regarding the poster sessions, I'd like to congratulate our two winners of the John A. Milner Postdoctoral Award. It goes to uh, Dr. Fiona Malcolmson from Newcastle University in the UK. And the AICR Graduate Student Award goes to Natalia Cortez from UC Davis. Another benefit of having the virtual conference was we had attendees from Australia, from Sweden, from France, from the UK, from Brazil. So it's really made it easier for people to attend and we really appreciated that diversity of attendance. So congratulations to our award winners. And now that that concludes the 2021 AICR conference, it's time to look forward to 2022, when we intend to be in person in Leesburg, in Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C. 31st of October to the 2nd of November. Sign up for updates, save the date, and we look forward to welcoming you there. Thank you very much.